Well, we are back with a, another Slettercast episode. I'm Trevor Erickson, one of the hosts of the program. We are in Canada today. Mm. We are in Edmonton, Alberta, at the Alberta Snowmobile Show. And we've got Jeremy Hankey and Sheena Thomas today on the show. We've got a great show lined up. We're going to talk about, obviously, these two and what they're doing up here in Canada and talk a lot about the avalanche world, so the avalanche safety training space and uh, what's currently being done, some ideas and, and tips and opinions on what can, what can be done to be, to be better, mm-hmm. to enhance that training and probably mostly just bring it more to the forefront of how it's not just a one and done type of thing, but it's something that you should be constantly learning and getting and increasing your skill set and knowledge in that space. So it's not, it's not a, a topic that's new by any means, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's one that needs to be refreshed. And I think as far as that goes, you guys are very much deep into that space. So yeah, learning about avalanches is a graduated process, you know, like you didn't learn how to drive overnight. You, you had to learn the gas pedal, the brake, and then somebody taught you about a stop sign and a school sign and traffic lights. And and the avalanche world isn't just like, hey, I did my driving course, I'm good. It's a graduated learning process. Yeah. And as your driving skills or riding skills increase, your avalanche knowledge needs to increase as well. So. I think historically for snowmobiling, people were okay with like a three hour awareness. And then then maybe they did like a level one that got them two days of education. But that really is just, uh, that's dad taking you to the gravel road and driving up and down and practicing the brake pedal and what the stop sign means. Mm-hmm. It's not giving you a Ferrari and putting you downtown Tokyo. Yeah. So it's a, it's a graduated learning process. Yeah. And people need to be open to that because now we're riding Ferraris in downtown Tokyo. Yeah, the way the machines. That's a great are. way to put it, mm-hmm. actually. So, and we're gonna we're gonna jump into that. Uh, but first, talk to me about you guys. You guys are <laughs> brother and sister, right? <laughs> no, just Look pretty similar, right? <laughs> it's the teeth, I think. The teeth. Yeah. <laughs> well, I not think quite. No, not, she's, she's got, got a little bit better teeth, teeth than you. But, I uh, would say the whole package, but. <laughs> well, I am from Edmonton. Well, I'm not from Edmonton, but I'm from Canada, so, you know. It makes sense. Grow up playing hockey yeah, and you can't ice skate, so you got to fight. Yeah. Nope. That's why you got no teeth. <laughs> so we've both been snowmobiling our whole adult lives and really didn't know each other up until the same year we started dating, maybe a, a couple of years later, I guess. I, Which was how long ago? Uh, well, I was going to say, I took the actual avalanche course first. So okay. that's how I first ever met him. Um, took his course, opened my eyes to what I needed to know, and then we didn't really hang out for a while. And then fast forward a couple of years, 2018, um, I had an oopsie moment, (laughs) ran my sled through some water, got it stuck in the slush, spun my drivers, left it on the mountain, went home, and he's the only one that wasn't like at a nine to five job who would come help me get Mm -hmm. my sled. So look up the phone number of Jeremy Hankey, hey, can you come help me? retrieve my broken down sled yeah and somehow i that's that phone number doesn't need to be handed out to too many people because when there's problems in the back country it seems to ring too much <laughs> and if they're friends of friends it's like i'm this i'll go get you from the back country in the middle of the night or i'll Who come you help call? you rescue your sled like I call just, you jeremy dog the bounty hunter jeremy oh, right there. something like that yeah <laughs> i'm working on the hair <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so a 2018 is kind of when when you guys connected mm-hmm. and, and the relationship started. Now you guys are, are a couple. Yeah. You reside in, where at exactly in Canada? Well, we have two places. We're lucky. We have one in Sycamus. Okay. Uh, we have a condo. And then we have my place, which is 20 acres uh, right outside of Revelstoke. And uh, we have a nice big timber frame house. We use it as a lodge. So we jump back and forth. We have a condo on the water in Sycamus, and then we rent that. And then we live in the lodge, and then vice versa. So what do you do on the 20 acres? Because <laughs> uh, well, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> it's Well, it's uh, Revelstoke. It's an interior rainforest, so it's a lot of forest. And, uh, and you, guys rent, you guys rent the lodge out? Is that what you guys in do? the winter months, the winter? yeah. So like a lot of our avalanche clients will come stay in the lodge facility, train in. We yeah. have a teaching space in the shop, and... And we do it all in-house and give them like more of an experience than it is just a classic structured course, you yeah. know. So we spend a lot of time hands-on in the field. In, so we load up, 
teach in the morning, go out for a ride, apply the knowledge that was taught. And yeah, it's a it's a great that seems setup. Like an efficient way to do it, yeah. Yeah, and we can ride right out the door, mm -hmm. so that's also helpful. And depending yeah. on what level of education we're delivering, you know, we might ride out the door. We might try to find more uh, challenging avalanche train to manage to teach. Yeah. I'd rather application and knowledge is retention. So if you can't teach them how to apply it, they'll never retain it. So yeah. you got to do it in the field. Is really where the retention happens. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So winter months, you guys are you guys are at the lodge. Uh, no, we're at my place, and we rent out the lodge. The lodge, there yep. you go. Yep. And then we flip six months of the year. We flip. We'll be at the lodge all summer, fixing it up, taking care of it, broken down sleds, whatever we're working on. He's working on whatever he's doing. Uh -huh. And we stay at my condo in Sycamuse. Nice. So, so yeah, it works. has got to figure it out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they basically, it doesn't really make us a lot of money, but it pays for them. So yeah. it, it, it works out pretty yep. good. Yeah, yeah, Airbnb mine. And yeah. Yep, and good. then ours are just word of mouth, like kind of treat it like a country club. If you know us, it's cool. Like all my family guns are in it, you know, all the nice, beautiful paintings. It's my home. So yeah. when we rent it out and uh, that's what I love about this sport is that, you know, I can rent it out and if some, they, somebody wrecks something, they take ownership of it. You know, everybody's a, everybody in the sport. I've only ever been ripped off once <laughs> in this, in the 15 years I've been doing this. So I'll like people will contact me like, okay, a $6,000 avalanche course with a lodge booking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just leave the money on the table. No problem. Only ever been ripped off once. Wow. And sledders are good years. people. Yeah, sledders are good people. Because it's a pretty, I mean, it's a, relatively speaking, it's a small community. Niche. It's a small community. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you burn someone real quick. It gets around. It gets around, right? Mm, totally. Yeah. For so. sure. And, and that's North America, like, because I've been doing talks around North America for a while. And well, my whole friend group, Duncan, all that stuff, is, yeah. uh, it's all from motorsports or from this sport in yeah. particular. Yeah. So. so before we get we get deep into kind of the, the avalanche stuff, it's kind of a fun story. Maybe some of those who are listening here to the Slettercast podcast, they re, they remember because I remembered this. I thought, what the heck? That is bizarre. We have a a phone recovery <laughs> story, a pretty epic phone recovery story, and it was interesting to me because I was telling these guys earlier, I'm in the same boat. Mm -hmm. I was uh, snow biking for the first time just outside of Yellowstone and Island Park. And so I was capturing all sorts of stuff with, with, with the Jackalopes crew. If they're watching, they're out of Boise. They took me out. And so I was catching all sorts of stuff on the phone for the first time mm -hmm. on the snow bike. It was a hoot. And my phone was, I had 10% left. We were on our way out. I'm like, hey, I'm going to just throw this into airplane mode. Yeah. And go out. Well, climb onesie, put it in right here. Didn't zip this darn pocket back up. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple rolls off the bike and next thing i know no the idea it's gone yeah. mm -hmm. i have no idea where it's at and and my phone is in airplane mode mm -hmm. so you can't ping it now mm -hmm. to tell you where it's at mm -hmm. i just kind of have a general location and so it's it's lost but i've got that content on there that i want to go want back it. up into the summer and you know, take some bikes in there and try and figure it out. But you've got a system for this. It, it's recoverable, <laughs> yeah, because you, you were online at one point. And yep. You were in an airplane mode, so it has a general location. And someone was, so Mac, a partner here at DB and Inc., he was actually, he had a, a torn ACL, so he was kind of following us on Fine Friends. Oh, yeah. And so he, exactly he did where you see, were. so we have, like, kind of mm -hmm. my last known location of that did, thing Did before. you do, like, it's an Apple phone, right? Apple. So find my phone? Yeah, you did that, but it 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 wouldn't tell me where. Like I could get to the last place that it, that it sent. had, yeah. and then where Mac had pinged me last mm -hmm. on find on find friends. So, so you just need to do a grid search. Yeah. So you need to go back in the summer, square out your four hundred foot by four hundred foot, and grid grid your way through the problem. Yeah, and look for it. Spend a day or something. I I was lucky because you know the way it went for us was we were teaching an avalanche course. And uh, I lost the phone. We had a bunch of stuff going on. I don't keep my phone on me because I worry a little bit about the transceiver interference. I'm super hypersensitive to all the little politics of it because of my own story. But I keep it in a little otter box, and I'm very stringent. On the front that. of the sled. Uh, yeah, yeah, right on the front. So I, I pinned it down. I thought I closed it, and I hit a couple jumps, and then it must have popped. And okay, I recognized it gone pretty quick. Knew roughly where it was, couldn't find it with the crew, went back out, came back a few days later with a different group, fluffed up about a 200 square foot area, didn't win. And then I was 
headed to Roatan to go scuba diving and get engaged to this young lady here. So I nice. just left. And, uh, and I had a really good idea where it was. So I came back. And like you, I had some stuff I wanted on it. How, phone, how important is the phone? Actually, it had, it had the last 25 years of my GPS tracks. All of our riding tracks. Of all my secret zones. That's worth some money right there. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> so getting a hold of that would have sucked. You for don't me. want that Because those, are, those aren't <laughs> uploaded to somewhere. Like, yeah. those are secret. They're on the yeah. phone. So uh, I wanted it back. So in the summer, I knew that I waited for the snow to melt a little bit. And my sister come through. So going for a quick heli flight landed, stepped off, and if I would have brought that search team up another 20 feet, I would have fluffed it out of the snow, but I <laughs> stepped out of the, and because the snow had just melted and it was dimpled out, and I kind of timed the snow melt. That's the key. Yeah. If it just melts enough so that the snow, or the phone hasn't gone down, yeah. it creates a little puddle, so you got this little blue puddle with the, your phone shining, and you can just see it. I could see it from the helicopter yeah. when I flew out. Because that's, that was the next move, right? You went, you went up in a helicopter. Yeah. Flew over. Yeah, so I had family you come in. You were messing around. Uh, well, I had family come in, and, and that's one thing you can do around Revelstoke. That's a cool experience. So I kind of hijacked the family flight and <laughs> flew by, and I was like, oh, yeah, there it is. Let's just put down here for a minute. With, with your naked eyes, or did you have, like, binoculars? No, no, we flew pretty you low. Pretty low? Yeah. Okay. You kind of had, well, you kind of had that general area, so mm -hmm. of where we thought it was. And so. I've got, I've spent a fair amount of time in a helicopter throughout my mountain career, so I feel, feel pretty comfortable with uh getting nice and tight and having a look and having getting the pilot to move in and so I can actually see where I want to see, you know, and that takes its own <laughs> communication strategy to get that pilot to be able to have the visual mm -hmm. on, on the ground and what you want to look at. And so I was able to just to see the small little reflection in the dimple, and I figured it, because it's black, it's going to take on sun, and it's yep. going to give me a little dimple to look for. And but for your ping yeah. there, or your last known, if it's... Um there's, there's two pockets. There's either a 50-meter pocket or mm -hmm. a 200-meter pocket, depending on how your ping was, airplane mode or not. Yeah. And so we first started with the 50-meter pocket, and we got all of our students to put their <sighs> shovels into hoe mode. Just did the whole thing, nothing. Spanned out to the 200-meter, did the whole thing. And then when we actually found it on the helicopter, it was 20 feet away from where Just we... Just barely. So, so that close. thing's pretty accurate, yeah. then. They're pretty close, yeah. yeah. yeah but you, you got to kind of watch it. Like, I found drones that way. I left them for a little while, re recovered. But this last year, <laughs> I had a chain case blow up. And uh, I was just in a huff, and I just decided to leave the machine, come back with parts, and fix it. And uh, so I left my... I, I forgot my phone in the dash because I don't put it on me. And I get to the bottom of the truck. I'm like, oh, my phone's gone. Okay, well, whatever, no big deal. Nobody's going to grab my sled and drag it out of there, so we'll go back tomorrow. And just out of fun, I woke up in the morning and checked my other phone just to find my phone, and it showed it in a completely different town. 250K away. And I'd learned to trust these things because I've found things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but You know that thing's telling you the truth right now. So, yeah, so I wake <laughs> up in the morning, I'm like, somebody's grabbed my sled and drug it out of there. I'm like, okay, so we start creeping on properties. <laughs> and we end up in kind of a sketchy area, ran into another sledder. Now we're kind of like, okay, maybe like somebody did grab the sled. Okay, well, before we get too crazy here, let's just go back up and see if it was there. Phone, everything there. But still in the mountain. So still in the mountain. On that instance. Wow. Yeah, so it pinged at 250 kilometers away. We have no idea yeah. why. And I drove to where that ping was. Wow. <laughs> but, yeah, it so totally you, lied to so me. So you can trust it, but occasionally it, it might just yeah. pull a smooth one on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah it definitely pulled a smooth one on me. Yeah. I lost the whole day and then <laughs> went back, and I'm like, oh, it's right there. Like I'm sure a better out, way better outcome. Yeah, well, well I was much happier with that. Yeah. Yeah. The other, other way wasn't going to go great no. for anybody. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but, no. Yeah, so I don't know how much you can, if it makes sense, I guess go with it. If it doesn't yeah. make sense, you got to wonder. But so you, And then your number is what for phone recovery? So if people want to <laughs> get, get a hold of you? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty good. And, uh, yellow pages. Yeah, yellow pages. Yellow pages. <laughs> if you go to deviantinc.com and scroll down to contact me. Just hit the contact. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait till we get the first one of those. <laughs> Forward that one right over. Right over, <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Let's let's kind of transition into so my first interaction with Jeremy was a couple of years ago, over the phone or maybe it was a Skype or a video call, and we were chatting about I had a question for him because, and it was just out of just my own kind of being intrigued with it was, we're in Southeast Idaho, you got Utah, Idaho, you know Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, we were there was a lot of it felt like a a, a lot of fatalities in 
with avalanches and snowmobilers. And I was telling Jeremy, I'm like, I, I don't know why I don't hear as much as many avalanche fatality snowmobile driven, you know, avalanches happening up there in, in Canada where you guys ride. And maybe it's just because it's not traveling. That news doesn't travel down. And I remember, I, what I remember about that is it was more along mindset and training. It's kind of years ahead up there than what's going on down here in the States. And that kind of stuck with me a little bit. And so I pulled some numbers and I fact checked these with these guys earlier today. I was just curious, like, okay, snowmobile related fatalities, Canada versus the U.S. over the last three years pulled them from the avalanche.org and then avalanche.ca website. Uh, pretty repu- reputable sources there. Mm-hmm. Trustworthy sources. Trustworthy, trustworthy sources. So 2023, all right, uh, Canada to snowmobile fatalities in 2020. So this last season, mm-hmm. 2023, versus the U.S., nine. 2022, so we go back another year. We've got one snowmobile fatality. Mm-hmm. And, uh, verse six in the U.S., and then in 2021, four in Canada, and nine in the U.S. So no matter no matter which way you're slicing this up, the U.S. is at least twice as many avalanche fatalities caused by s- uh, snowmobilers versus Canada. Mm-hmm. So the question that I think the next question, the, the two next questions are why and and or is there just is it just a an, a law of averages? Is there twice as many mountain snowmobilers in the the Rocky Mountain states? Right. Well, you're going after user days. It's really the conversation that you got to consider is yeah. how many user days to how many fatalities in an area. Yeah. And that could kind of give you that base number, and that's a number that is really hard to get. Sure. You know, is there more user days in a, an area in Utah compared to an area in, and let's say, British Columbia? When you say user days, just to be clear, that is days that are that that you can ride us that snowmobilers are, are riding are riding in an area. In an area. So yep. let's say if you took like like one spot in Utah and said there's 300,000 user days here to every two fatalities, number that you could work with yep. and learn from. Still, and, yeah. And we don't and we don't really especially in Canada or, or the U.S., that really have that user day number to really fully understand the scope the of mountain snowmobiling. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. if that was accurate and readily available, that's a super good number to, it's to just know and be like, we're struggling here. We need to really yeah. step, step it up, you know? So I did a comparable like that for just in Canada in the 2000s versus 2010s and, and then now the 2020s. Mm-hmm. So I didn't do it in the States, but I looked through the... the the decades there and got the user days versus fatalities for my own knowledge so there's a trend there we can talk about after but i think what you're going after was like states versus canada yeah or so I, I do in my own i can theorize from my own experience mm-hmm. if we're in this for over 25 years of riding and probably 15 years of avalanche education and watching the numbers shift you know but you want to go with solid data yeah there's a large increase in fatality of motorized use in the u.s and and in canada we've done a good job at reducing that but if you look at our numbers in the early 2000s we had a real big uptick Mm -hmm. a lot and so in early the early 90s in the british columbia backcountry we had a big influx of skiing and snowboarding and recreational activities so that's where the first real avalanche rec courses mm-hmm. originated from. And I was a part of that influx in, in the early 90s on the snowboard and, and doing a lot of that activity. And the death tolls were really, really up between 90 to 95. So then they developed a recreational avalanche course. and uh, For skiers. Yep. And that started taking effect. And, and that made a, a good help. But a nice comparison is 2000 to 2005 snowmobile fatalities in Canada another huge uptick mm-hmm. and we were started losing a large number of people and so it was heavily on the public's radar or, or government radar as well as well as all the news broadcasts and and local public and then we had a, a black swan event within the big what they called the big iron shootout avalanche where we had uh, potentially 180 people buried and only two lost Boulder their Mountain, lives 2010 
So that's, yeah, it's kind of, that's why they call it a black swan event. Wow. It, it leaves the ether of a culture after about 10 years. So uh, there's a lot of those smart people out there that understand that human mentality culture. And so in Canada, we're trying to revamp up with the idea of that black swan event, Boulder, being gone from the ether of the culture, saying, okay, well, we need to re-educate, re-push our marketing and awareness mm -hmm. before we have another major event. But that's where our culture here shifted. That's where we, s we realized we needed to have more awareness and education for snowmobilers specifically, and it kind of took a shift there. And um, I can't speak for the States, but I don't know if that There's shift that, has happened. I don't think that, I'm not aware of, of, of something as well, drastic Nothing as of that, that magnitude has really happened to the motorized community in the U.S. And I think there's there's also the the population base and how it's spread out through your mountainous regions is one thing. Mm -hmm. You definitely have a, a, a spread out of avalanche culture and avalanche organizations that do their best to message it to the motorized community, even though the, a lot of them are ski snowboard based and the cultures have two different approaches. So those organizations are trying to get themselves articulated so they're reaching to the motorized community in that messaging and what you have is 2000 we get ferraris so instead of just driving an old chevelle you know we now have something that has you know we're not bolting plastic to them anymore we have tracks we have mountain specific machines so does our education match the machine no but we do have a culture that you know, avalanches haven't really bothered us until about It's because we couldn't get anywhere when it stormed. Yeah. Our sleds couldn't mm -hmm. take us there <coughs> so when it stormed, yeah. So why to where we currently are in the numbers that you run are different. Why was Canada successful? We have a, a strong mountain guiding community that's quite big, and the avalanche culture in the U.S. is really based around the ski hill cultures that mitigate avalanches for recreational use. Here we have a bunch, in Canada, we have a bunch of recreational... Uh, professional guides so mm -hmm. there was this big strong avalanche understanding how to mitigate the problem which was a help and then those people were in conjunction of starting to develop that concept and since we had these big events happening and a lot of people dying we started figuring out how awareness would work how communication tactics would work and how we could reduce the fatalities so and it's a huge economic driver for our province and since we only our one province we have less government organizations to work with and a bunch of stuff like that and bureaucracy to get through so we are able to shift adjust and create the proper messaging and start morphing the culture and culture shift mm -hmm. and we've been successful with that i would say but there, when you bring up numbers like that we're uh, there's a lot of variable there's snowpack variation there there's the user days that we can't really condone so um, unless you have a good solid user base number, mm -hmm. then you can't really understand if your fatalities are increasing or not. Yeah. You know, so maybe it's, uh, maybe it's still the same percentage of fatalities, just more users. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But either way, no fatalities. Like in my opinion, you can ride a snowmobile and really extremely reduce your risks if you understand how to drive that snowmobile in Tokyo. But nobody taught you about the rules of the road in Tokyo. And they, and we're still missing that a little mm -hmm. bit. Like, a lot of ski culture that's trying to transfer our avalanche culture over is... Uh, Not hitting with the sledders. Well, they don't know how to teach them how to apply it because they don't do the sport. So we need more avalanche professionals that do the sport that can understand how to instruct, how to apply that knowledge. Yeah. Otherwise, without application, there is no retention for the, for the person learning. So um, I think there's a miss in the delivery and the content in general in motorized avalanche education that hopefully will upswing soon. So uh, helping shift the avalanche culture about what needs to be developed for motorized use as yeah. well. In yeah. our, our riding area, like our mountainous terrain that is avalanche terrain, is m it's condensed to the west coast, like British Columbia, right? We don't have a lot of mountain riders the rest of Canada. In the States, it's kind of all over different areas yeah. people are riding. And so it's easier to shift a culture when it's condensed to a smaller area. So there's a lot, you know, if I go out riding with someone new and I ask them, do they have avalanche training? Like, I'm not trying to demean them they, they already know they should and they're going to be honest and and they're going to say no i don't but I, I need to get it and the likelihood of them going to get it is really high because they don't want to be putting that they don't want to be they don't want to say no again right no it's, and that conversation you don't feel good yeah right and that conversation's happening all the time in these little communities here because it's condensed and everyone knows everyone 
foot. Well, and I think because British Columbia is such a smaller spread out community, everybody has a story, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody knows somebody that knows somebody. And most of those guys don't want to talk about that story because it's a traumatic story. Mm -hmm. And so they don't share in that. So some people leave the sport after that and whole riding groups leave the sport or some like, like I was, like most men, you just stuff it in your back, your pocket and move on. And you don't really visit it because it brings out all the emotion. So, yeah. but that doesn't allow anybody to learn from the near miss. And then a lot of people just think it's, uh, it's just an uh, inherited risk and it's unmanageable and the chances. Or the, it won't coming. happen to me. Yeah. And, but it, but it is extremely manageable. I don't ride in. The, I don't ride in those zones. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, and they don't. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. I was. I ten years of riding. Ignorance is bliss. No idea. Mm -hmm. And so, Jeremy, you're you're so passionate about this because, and this is a story you have told before, mm -hmm. but you have a you have your own experience that you that you draw from. Yeah, well, with that's. This. And it, you know, it's funny because it'll bring a tear to my eye, but I don't draw it. So, everybody kind of goes after. Yeah, I was buried. I was six feet deep. And another guy was buried above me. Uh, another group put a line over our heads, cut out a, a, a large avalanche, and it, uh, it took out four of us that were parked below. We had a lot of fault in this accident, too. And same with the people that put a line over our heads. So can you pause one second? Yeah. So this was in, two, you told me this was 2003. Correct, So yes. 20 years ago. So, so Hang on, hang on that. I'm going to correct that for once. Okay. For a long time, I ran 2003. And it's because I didn't ever want anyone to find out who wow <laughs> still 20 years later the guy that died mm. i didn't want them to have to relive the story mm -hmm. i always lied about the date <laughs> I've been bringing, I, I corrected it a bunch of times lately because I'm like, hey, it actually happened this year and called him out. I'm like, why do you say it? And he just. Yeah, so I've actually never said that publicly. Wow. It's actually 2004. 2004. You know, to protect the other parties involved. Yeah. <laughs> this. Oh, yeah. Oh, crazy. I've told this story. God, I don't know how many times, but yeah. it's a different factor because he, uh, he lost his life. I didn't. Yeah. You can tell the story. <laughs> Save me the minute. for. <laughs> I've so told this story in front of thousands of people and get away with not crying. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes when you allow yourself to go back to the reasons, it hits you. Mm -hmm. So that's so what it is. if I can ask a question here, maybe give us an idea of, because we assume now, okay, there were probes. There were awesome beacons. Mm -hmm. We had we had airbags back because we have airbags now, right? But but what type of equipment was that? Because there's some people who are probably watching this that shoot. They may not have even been born in 2004. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Or they're just so small they don't. So what was normal as far as e equipment goes? Back so then? that and that's what kind of brings up the crying a little bit. Was uh, it was old school stuff like to run that stuff. You had to. Somebody had to spend four or five hours with you just to learn how to swedge it mm -hmm. and swing it around. So if you had a multiple burial situation, it was a real problem. You're not problem, looking at yeah. numbers. You're not looking at arrows for direction. Yeah. You're listening to a noise. You put on a little headset or it's got a, like an audio and you're listening to the beep and you're swedging it to make it louder as you move towards the victim. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell if there's two victims. Like yeah. You're just going in for one. You can if you're really trained. You're, you're really good at what you're doing, but... For a general person training, like that situation, having four missing, plus unaccounted people in the other group, it's like other people in insane. the group. So, so group one, call it my group. Group one, we're parked underneath the face, right, and we're dealing with a broken down sled from jumping off a cliff. And then, group two comes into the area, and uh, group two, two riders ahead. One guy goes shooting up the slope above us with his best friend in tow. Gets up. Crests over the classic trigger point of the convexity. Triggers a very large slab avalanche on my group below. And his friend's in tow. The climb carries on. And then uh, the avalanche comes down, swoops up. A bunch of us run. I wait for a camera guy. And he's yelling, take me, take me. And he throws a camera in the bag, and I take him, and then we get hit. And the two guys I trust the most with my life, I watch right in front of me get gobbled up. And uh, so I, I've relived the story, so all the... The images are very vivid for me. And uh, 
so uh, for me, I think I'm done, you know, like, uh, the two guys I trust the most in my group are buried with me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so you kind of wait, you do all that sort of stuff, but not to get, cause we'd be here a long time getting into the whole in depth of it. But what happens next is I think what's kind of interesting is, uh, one of our younger members of the group self rescues and organizes, but group number two, their friends are still driving around on the debris and uh, they don't know what's happened. They were kind of late into the bowl, you know? Mm-hmm. And so they actually get almost getting fist fights with them, trying to get them to turn their transceivers off so they could look Order for the search. missing signals. Yeah. Yeah. So they manage that, and then they get me. And while well, they get it, I was buried underneath another guy. And they get him, and then they, they get me, and then they go looking for nobody. They're like high-fiving. But the group that's sitting on the corner is like, hey, we're missing a guy still. And so they're like, oh, okay, well, that explains these because weird the guys, blue skis. Because the guys who do, there was, mo- mo- there was another, well, they were buried as well. Yeah, so and the he, guy that crested, triggered, but best friend in tow. He's the one who's he's still missing. missing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so he's missing, and so they start another search, and then they don't get a transceiver signal, and they're searching, and then the friends say, like, well, hey, he's not wearing one of those. And uh, they say, okay, well, those are the blue skis, and these guys have, have, you know, a decent rec course back in the day. And so they pull out a probe line, and they get the guy at 30 centimeters deep type thing, laid out flat, right? Wasn't wearing a transceiver? Wasn't wearing. Left it in his, uh, what makes me cry? (laughs) Left it in his hotel room. His baby. With his wife and baby. But if he had been wearing it, they would have found him first, and Jeremy wouldn't be here, which is... What I usually don't say. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It's okay. It's, <clears throat> you that's, know. That's a, that's tough. No matter how you cut that, that's, that is, that's a tough one to deal with for sure. I've used the story to motivate for years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've never really allowed myself to go to this section of the story. Because it is... Because everybody knows everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll let you carry it. <laughs> so that's, I mean, you can you can tell that's where the passion's coming from now. Because when something hits that deep, yeah, holy cow, you you either run away from that or you do you fight as hard as mm-hmm. you can to make sure that doesn't he tried, happen again. He tried for a while to to kind of just let it go and get back into it, get back into sledding. Life continues, but he's petrified of everything. It's a thing he thinks he has to get over. But fast forward a couple of years, and snowmobilers are dying. They're making the same mistakes that his group or group two made. And at this point, outside cultures are saying, we're the problem, we're the ones who aren't learning. Yeah. And he's thinking in his head, well, you haven't given us a course or an opportunity to learn our way. We're a different culture. We're, we're not skiers. Yeah, for me, like after that, I, I walk away like most men do, and pump. I'm an oil and gas guy. Pump it all in the back pocket and don't ever deal with it. And then oil and gas out here slows down in 08, and I'm kind of I got a house in Revelstoke. I ride all the time, and luckily, like I I went and bought a snowmobile after the accident. Went back out there because mountains were my life, and mm-hmm. it was good. I was fine, but. All my friends really have high risk tolerances, so to be back out there, I had to be hyper-analytical about every risk, so it's what made me good at it. So I still wanted to go out there, push myself, have a lot of risk, but I had to become very structured on how to minimize that risk to make myself feel very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so had a big snowboard background, had a lot of mountaineering accomplishments underneath my belt, and and it took quite a few years to once again feel comfortable in the backcountry. And how I did that was... Of course, through education and, and good group riding habits and, and understanding... Trusting your partners. Understanding yeah. the problem and how to manage it. So that's what made me good at this. But the avalanche world, all of a sudden, a lot of people were dying, like Sheena mm-hmm. just said. And they didn't know how to outreach between the ski community to the uh, to the uh, snowmobile community. So uh, to start to reduce the fatality numbers. Um, and because it was becoming such a problem in our small mountainous area you know all the news broadcasts government officials people writing their mlas that sort of stuff for politicians um there was a lot of hoopla to try to solve the problem and throw some money at it so at one point after the big boulder situation 
the government wanted to argue about licensing. And, uh, and licensing just, we didn't believe in it, the boat license had happened and there wasn't a lot of uptake. And so the avalanche world really argued for culture shift. Let's put money into culture shift. So that's what we did. We jumped in, uh, if you want to know more about my story, we did a product called Throttle Decisions mm -hmm. up there, which was like these eight educational chapters and a 30 minute piece on my burial because there was uh, a bunch of footage of it. You can get all of that on Avalanche Canada. It's free for anyone. Yeah, all the nice. chapters, we gave it all away for story. free. Yep. On avalanche.ca. Yeah, avalanche.ca yep. or Vimeo or YouTube if you Google Throttle Decisions. Kay. It's a little dated now, but yeah. uh, you know I still see it in the U.S. quite a bit. And uh, so we took the same sort of passion I gave you here a second ago and I put my heart on the sleeve and hopefully it motivated people to mm, entertain the idea or prioritize it. And, uh, but then with that being said, as I wo wove that flag for education, I started realizing like, well, they weren't really building motorized specific. And when I looked at what I was doing every day to feel better about it, well, they weren't really teaching that. Mm -hmm. So it started, I started kind of getting on a soapbox about it. and All of a sudden decided if he needed to be understood and believed in, like if, if he wanted to make change within the culture, he had to get the respect of the avalanche professionals too. Mm -hmm. So he went through all the steps that all the avalanche professionals went through, which he already had some background, but started the rec courses, went into the professional courses, did the mentorship, worked his way to the top avalanche professional so he could get pure kind of like buy-in, I don't know, pure buy-in from the avalanche professionals and then bring it over into the sled side. Yeah, yeah. well, in, in respect to the avalanche world, they're not going to listen to you until you're on, on their playing Same field. Play, yeah, and their absolutely. playing field's pretty high, especially mm -hmm. the Canadian system's a real in-depth system to be on their playing field. So, uh, and, I, and I agreed with that. So I can't sit here and, and bark, you know, an opinion unless I have a right to one. Mm -hmm. So I went down that path. And, uh, and then I've, it's just where it's took in my life for... 15 years, I guess. So the last, this is the last 15 years has kind of led up to, to kind of this moment where you're putting things together. Mm -hmm. You've seen, you've seen kind of the need in the motorized uh, community yeah. for avalanche training. And you've, you've done things publicly along the soul rides platform. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that's your, that's your website Yep. right now. You've got, you were telling me a little bit about what you have cooking as far as motorized training. And just the little bit that I got from you sounded very interesting. And so tell me about what's, what's going on with the courses and the, the training that you're putting together. So, uh, you know, it's not just the one story. There's a lot of actual personal stories with avalanches I got from being in the mountains at 150 days a season, every season for the last, for as long as I can remember. And so either they affected people I know or people I care about. or uh, the, So there's a lot of connection points there that motivate me to continue to push and stand on a soapbox and say, hey, we need to change this or we need to change that. And um, working with inside the bureaucracy of all the organizations, which they're all great, but it slows you down a little mm -hmm. bit. And uh, so this year, we've, well, the last three years, we've worked heavily on developing an online educational program. It doesn't just cater to Canadian, like, curriculum. Yep. It's also encompassing American curriculum, mm -hmm. so it's like a North American online so okay. I worked with Aerie for a while. Mm -hmm. we, we consulted on some of their development for their actual first true motorized curriculum built. So Aerie deserves, I really fly their flag. Not that they're the only flag you should fly but in the States, but they have a structured actual true curriculum. Yep. And uh, even though it still needs work and growth, it's a nice stepping stone for there. So I, you know, Duncan's a good counterpart yep. of mine in those adventures. But uh, even with that, it's still... You know, there's still motorized specific rescue, motorized terrain travel, um, stuff that works to help the actual user defend themselves from uh, that exposure or minimize the risk. You'll never take it down to nothing, just like driving around Tokyo. You know, yeah. it's like um, we're out there to take risk. It's an inherited risk, but it's a manageable risk if you're willing to learn how to drive in Tokyo. Yeah. So um, it's about being aware of what those risks are. And normally they're like sleeping sharks around there or, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it just, it just happens sometimes. And, and the same goes with rescue. So we developed an online learning tool and I dislike that in so many ways because it's so important to have hands-on education yep. with it. 
And, uh, and so I was a real naysayer originally to it, but then trying to help develop curriculum and stuff's been slow going. Mm-hmm. So I just put my money where my mouth is and my time and I uh, said, well, fine, I'll just put it all into an online course and then really promote people, take that experience and then go get hands-on yeah. education yeah. with it. So it's like, okay, here's the, here's the level that, that is like the bare minimum. Mm-hmm. Let's get as many people here Correct. As we can. Show yep. them what they don't know. Yes, let's get them here yep. and and stress, like, this is this is like just what you should be at. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you got to go get the rest. Well, and I think in our in our leadership culture uh, t- as well, too, I'll call the pot kettle black, is like there's a lot of very experienced high-end snowmobilers with very limited avalanche knowledge. Mm-hmm. And, and then those people are looked up to as like, hey, I want to be like that person. But when that person can't articulate or help mentor that next step into the avalanche knowledge because they're shy about it or they don't know and they're insecure about being able to communicate what needs to be there it doesn't help the next generation coming up so Mm -hmm. we have to help shift that to that hey this is worthwhile but then in the snowmobiler's defense going to sit in the classroom for seven hours and listen there's there's not a lot of take home there yeah and and they're probably weighing okay do I want to spend a day a in the classroom yep. or do mm-hmm. I want to go on the mountain? Yeah. yeah. So he's, he's battling that too. He's done it in a couple great steps. So it's, it's online, but first chunk is just awareness. So it's your open your eyes. This is what you don't know. This is what you should know. Lo- lots of laughs, little jokes, pokes at your buddies, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then you stack it up with your actual level, level one. But remember, that's not your hands on. That's yep. just your classroom component. Classroom part of it. So you do your awareness, and your level one, and then you've got the, the bare minimum for your eight, hours ish of Mm -hmm. classroom portion but the whole time we're like reminding you just because you can see it on here and just because we're telling you doesn't mean you can actually do it you need to practice like you ever watched a youtube video and they show you how to fix your truck and then you walk outside you're like well that doesn't make sense and you have to watch a youtube video 16 more times you got to get hands on you got to practice it to make it work yeah And, and i do wonder like how much People go to an awareness and just silly small words, I think, is what we kind of corrected in Canada a little bit. When you there's avalanche awareness, right? And that's that three hour talk. And that's great. It brings awareness to it, but it's mm-hmm. not a class. No. It's not education. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. the same every year, really it's the same it's the same program. Yep. On repeat. Mm-hmm. And Correct. you hope you get new people there every year and it it's kind of beneficial. But mm-hmm. it's really it's really just the same. I think it's just the understanding that it's straight awareness. It's not education. And to do this sport and understand the risks. And I have, I want to go out there and take risks. That's my whole gig. I'm not the naysayer. I still want to jump off a cliff and I still want to take those, but I don't want to take unnecessary risk. I don't want to just walk across the road and see if a school bus hits me both ways, you know? So, but I think what we've done incorrectly somewhat in the avalanche culture world is, is that we allow people to think that, oh, that, avalanche class that we promote on a poster is actual training which it's not yeah it's that's it's an awareness talk and that's yeah. it and i and yeah. actually and i don't i didn't want to put that in a negative light because mm-hmm. i've been to those mm, and there's great. not one that will tell you this is avalanche training yeah. they will tell you this this is just awareness mm-hmm. you know and somehow the culture is yeah wanting to say like it, it, maybe it's the snowmobile culture is just wanting to say oh i got training yeah I went to my training today but mm-hmm. and so they don't want to invest or not want to allow myself to come on here and cry or anything else is like there's a risk yeah there's an inherited risk by going out there but if you actually understand the problem you can seriously manage it yeah. to really minimize it and you just have to be willing to invest in that knowledge yeah. so okay. we're hoping this online course now like course without the hands-on is more accessible so everyone who has a weekend or has a month to sit down it's broken down into modules they can do like a is module it self-paced self-paced mm-hmm. yeah self-paced. totally places you can click i pause can do it in june i can do it in whenever March, you want so you can, can replay it. a section you forgot or you want to watch again so you have you can use it to your own schedule okay as much as you want so you get the knowledge as much as you want and then computer and mobile like can, yep. I, can i be on my phone too 100 yeah mm-hmm. next year it'll be in its own app form okay it's always done one of those classic uh one of the top notch um online learning platforms so yeah it's all structured that way and um i won't have it done now but i actually have one of the one of my mentors who's a professor for a university is gonna do all the academic side so i took my 
real world approach, mm -hmm. dump my heart and soul and passion into the visuals and that delivery. And then in the module portions or the script portions of those, um, it will be a whole academic approach delivered from him. So nice. Uh, so I have a, a, an actual university teacher yeah. developing all that sort of stuff for the keeners. Like Sheena learns that way. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, that's probably what makes me good at this. I'm a old redneck, rough around the edges. You got to kind of beat it into my head. And for someone like Sheena, she learns theory. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, so his the, course is a good mix of both. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just really trying to shift that way and uh, and just stop that number yeah. nine. Like for some reason, like I'm connected to every one of them for some reason. Not sure why, but it's uh it's something I carry for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure like there's other guys in here with the same story, but they yeah. don't want to talk about it because that happens and they're yeah. shy. Yeah, get over it. I got no teeth. I'm I'm okay with my <laughs> manism. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But, so, mm -hmm. I appreciate you coming on here and, and and sharing that story and and it's it's obvious like where your passion comes from and so how cool is it to think like you know the podcast space YouTube video like going to work I'm at or you're at work and you just throw the training on mm -hmm. the 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 awareness training that you guys have on that platform and just let that thing roll you know let it play. Become familiar with it. Throw it in the car on your way. Maybe you're not watching it, but you can listen. Yeah. You can listen to it. Doesn't mean that's the, the first and only time you're going to go through it, but at least it's it's repetitive, and yep. you're just getting, you know, aware of those things. And, and Yeah, and I try to make it entertaining as well. There's so. movie clips. There's Mo jokes. There's I like mean, you're rolling with the green screen. A green screen. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah, so who funny. knows what's going to be, who <laughs> knows what can pop up you know, there, I put, the old green screen. I put about 200 grand worth of effort into it. So it's, uh, I You're put my money where around. my mouth was. Yeah. And because um, that's been my goal since I somehow pulled this emotional experience back out and lived through all the other emotional experiences I've had throughout the mountains and my time in it. And I love the mountains and I'd never want to not be in them. And, and wanted to share and shift that culture so if people can feel comfortable going out there and, uh, and not have their wife be like, oh, it's, you know, avalanche hazards that extreme. Mm -hmm. And like, and I think a lot of the organizations kind of fear monger a little bit, you know, it's like, you can't go snowmobiling, avalanche is that high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can go snowmobiling. Pick you just proper have to train. Pick yep. appropriate train. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the content was built for skiing and snowboarding. Well, in skiing and snowboarding, I have to be on 30 degree pitch. Have fun, yeah. To have fun. So if you can identify what avalanche train is, where the runout zone is, you can still go snowmobiling. Mm -hmm. But if you can't, then maybe high should scare you out of the backcountry. Yeah. And so the avalanche organizations don't articulate that very well and that shift in sort of train use. So I figure, I hope something like this can help yeah. the, our motorized community get motorized specific target, but still absolutely need to actually learn how to do on in all the of my friends driving from across canada to go snowmobiling this winter watch it on your drive i know you have 18 to 24 hours drive perfect put it so on. that's a great question put how many on. hours is it total uh so total so you do the intro it's two and a half hours okay you do the whole level one so intro into level b eight hours okay of content and all broken into there 10 to 15 right minute there. modules mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to come do hands-on courses with us after, you each individually have to register and come to me with a certificate. Yep. So, because I don't want to step backwards in my actual field yeah. portion for you. So, you'd have to actually complete it. But what I'm hoping to do with it on the international stage, so to speak, or Canada, U.S., and that's why I built it neutral between how airy and the communications of the American side and then the Canadian side is so that if people are doing it, they're going to ENDS, they're going to whoever else for hands-on, yep. it works in conjunction with what they're doing. Beautiful. And mm -hmm. the content that they're delivering. So the people are going to have the same vocabulary as they're yep. going to get in on hand, like infield with ENDS, These same mm -hmm. terms. Yeah. Same terms, same sort of approach. So it could be utilized in that yeah. conjunction as well. And then, and then it has my flavor to all the work. So we just had a couple posters at the International <laughs> Snow Science Workshop. Uh, in one, Bend, or in Oregon. Bend. Okay. So trying to get some peer review process from the avalanche world on terrain travel techniques and how what would be industry best practices, industry best practice for motorized avalanche rescue. And, and just in the morning, like for me, like there's good points and bad points. You can beep check somebody on a snowmobile as they drive by you, but you better be really proficient with that transceiver to not get messed up by a ghost signal 
presented. It all yeah. depends on manufacturer. So the electrical interference problem and how it affects us is a big part of that conversation Skiers out of the years. Skiers don't have that, right? Mm -hmm. They don't got the magneto and the sled running and the mm -hmm. shot and all that. Yep. So, and there's, that's kind of a new problem in the avalanche world that they're trying to wrap their head around is the electrical interference and how it affects us. So there's a bunch of content on there that doesn't matter if you're a long time guy, you've done a level two training program or whatever else, you'll, everybody will gain something mm -hmm. even from them. Yeah. And, uh, and learn a lot. And like I said, I, uh, I didn't mess around. I put yeah. a ton of passion and energy into it. It took me three years. That's amazing. Yeah. And this this training right now, I believe you said there's, it's is it free or so the no, first year? Right now, I'm just handing around so, the show so for free. So there you go. Go, go yeah. play with it. Let's yeah. get some feedback. That's Let's what I'm doing right now. And then I'll adjust. If I get a lot of feedback, like I'd say it came in at a low grade A and if I get a lot of great feedback, then I'll dump another bit of money into it and then update a lot. Like I had a bunch of three-dimensional visuals yeah. created and stuff like that and uh, to help that learning and retention. Yep. And I was a real naysayer at the beginning of this because I really feel I should teach hands-on, teach mm -hmm. hands-on. And that's where retention comes from. But now that I'm almost finished the whole program, I'm actually, I wonder, I, I'm not sure yet, but I wonder if I'm going to have better retention than I get from me teaching in the classroom. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah, absolutely. If yeah. I can, I'll be excited. But yeah. So it's out there right now. Here well, we've been walking around the slideshow handing out for people to yeah. have it for free, give us feedback, and then it'll be up for and sale. So for those listeners or those watching here, you know, this this will probably drop in a month and a half or so. Mm -hmm. So we're looking like end of November maybe, maybe first yep. part of December. What... Where can we go? Soul Rides? Is that where you're, hol Soul, is that where you're holding? Yeah, it? it's housed on soulrides.ca. And, okay. of course, that's got my hands on stuff. But if you go to courses, tickle right down to online, and then you're in. And it's uh, we're charging for the intro 25. We're giving a bunch of it away at the show. And, hey, if anybody's out there interested in packaging, and I'm interested in getting it out into the ether, so I, I'll give it away in, yeah. in the right context. And so the intro is 25, and the level one's 100. Okay. And that's Canadian, so you guys get like what and that's 39 percent that's, that's, that's like I pay that and I've got access for forever, forever for those levels. Yeah, those you can rewatch it, rewatch it, and then I plan on if there is a good upswing to it, then I'll do deliver a level two and a okay. three. And then the other thing I have on there, which I hopefully will add this year, is called backcountry preparedness. Yeah, so just all sorts of backcountry skills and emergency so response mer planning, first yep. aid. Yeah, like helling people out. Mm -hmm. Like me and Duncan, I don't know if you caught last year, we come across an arterial leg bleed, and uh, a fella got the J-hook from a Polaris and pulled his artery in his groin, and he was... That actually really does happen. Yeah, it he was leaking actually, pretty bad, did. yeah. And so we are getting dark, got him out, Sheesh. helied out. But just understanding heli extraction, winter survival, all those sorts of things. So we're trying to give that knowledge and the better preparedness yeah. for so we'll our industry. Yeah, keep an eye out for that one. Yeah. That'd be I, cool. So if we get enough upswing, I'll, yeah. I'll keep putting energy in. Well, cool. This was a good a good little motivation to, to go uh -huh. get into that course. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. just the awareness side, obviously, I think it just, you don't know what you don't know. He's, he, he's all like the awareness. Everyone says awareness. I like the culture, the word culture. Because the culture if, side if my of it. friends are holding me accountable... That's what I want. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I go riding with them, I expect that they hold their friends accountable yeah. so I don't have to check in with them well, too. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, like even like I put out this video the other day on Instagram of like the probe. People don't, like you don't buy the probe for yourself. Yeah. The, the probe in your friend's backpacks, the probe that looks for you. And people don't really click on that simplicity. The transceiver that they have, like that's the transceiver that looks for you. So take your brand new one, give that to them. Make sure that the transmitting antenna is working on theirs and take their old one Yeah. because you're better off with it and they have a better chance of finding you. Yeah. But people don't even click on those simplicities and maybe because they're not well presented in the mm -hmm. culture. But when you get all emotional like I just did is because you like I followed the kid. Mm -hmm. That's that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but. It's the fact that if he was wearing that transceiver that day, it was me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, uh, mm -hmm. but that's, but I, you can still go out there and do it safely, but you have to, you have to take into account the risks and then best manage them. Yep. And I just, I don't think a lot of people want to, uh, 
to accept that that's there. They would rather choose ignorance as bliss. It's because it's easier. And right? for me, but I don't I don't have that option anymore. Yeah. So I had to figure it out to yep. enjoy it. And and we still ride it up. We push limits all the day, but we were riding some avalanches last year. Oh for fun. yeah. We were setting them off and surfing them a little bit. Yeah. It can be managed. You can manage problems. Well, like when we were younger, like we were a little out of control. Like we were taking way too much risk. So. Nope. Yeah. yeah we we're just done. Went off. We're good. This was still going though. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I hope the the whole uh, exposure of motion helps people realize it's it's real. There's a lot of numbers. Yeah. And uh, and those people either leave the sport, don't ever do it again. They change their lives, or they they grow from it and they stay in the sport, or they just avoid yeah. emotionally dealing with it. And and even after 15 years of telling this story, it affects you. Mm -hmm. So it's uh. And and hopefully that that motion motivates is yeah. what I is why I allow myself to do it publicly. But yeah, well, thank you for mm -hmm. for choosing that route, and motivating and inspiring the many others, all of us, other people who haven't haven't unfortunately haven't personally dealt with those things. But yeah, it's funny because when you're a guy like me, they all find you then, right? Mm -hmm. All the survival stories, or you meet so many people that are similar. So then you get to share in all their experiences as they they want to debrief those situations, just the same way I have to, and I do it publicly and on camera. They want to do it in a closed room, and so you get to meet all those people, and there's lots of them. Yeah. And and but you know what? There's lots of people with real survival stories from guys that knew what to do. Yeah. And and that's I wish I wish the survivors would get out there and uh, and share their stories so that people realize that hey, the gear works, training works, being prepared and ready to respond, mm -hmm. and being able to mitigate in space gives you the ability and uh, understanding how to do it is worth your investment. And it's not just your money investment. And that's the nice thing about the online thing is, okay, like I can make it cheaper. But really my goal is to prove to you that you need to go another mm -hmm. step. So, yeah. And I just throw it out there for a cheaper price. So hopefully it motivates people to, to find that. And, you know, for me, I think the, the better curriculum in the U.S. right now to myself is the airy stuff. Mm -hmm. Because curriculum is four parts. It's the content being taught. It's the educator teaching it. It's the environment it's being taught in and the student that's taking it. Mm -hmm. That's true curriculum. And so they have they have put energy into a content. They have an instructor pool that actually has been trained to be instructors, not just, you know, they've learned how to become a teacher. They built some content, even though I do think we need to grow there quite a bit. And uh, and they're teaching in field, hands on. So mm -hmm. and it's it's such a conundrum for me to hand out hands on education or be such a hands on educated, motivated person, but put out online education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was a real challenge. So I'm hoping it goes positively. Yeah. Mm. Well, so are we. So we're down to the trusty camera. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So how about, w so we we usually round out these episodes with a lightning round, kind mm -hmm. of a fun way to kind of just round things out. I wasn't okay? thinking about that at all. Yeah, so you guys know the two <laughs> questions, right? We'll start with the easy one first, right? Yeah. So you both you both ride Skidoo, both are on Skidoos. Yep. Correct. Okay. So uh, 154, 155, what are you guys, what are you guys riding? I'm or, on sorry, 165. 160, uh, uh, five. You're 54. On, and you're on 54 and you're yep. on 65. Correct. Okay. So, brand new, bring her home. You get three choices, or you get three options of modifications, whatever you want to do to that bad boy. What are the first three things you're doing to, if you want to call it trick out or whatever it is, what are those your, 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 your three favorite things you're going to do? I get to go first. Okay. Because okay. it's going to be the same she thing. She goes first. All right. Uh, obviously, the to every every. I'm hoping every girl uh, I know and every guy says is risers and bars. Okay. <clears throat> I lower the risers and get bars fitted for me. Mm -hmm. So those easy. Um, <clears throat> but last year what I discovered, um, which I'll never go without now, something called trail tech. Mm. Uh, it's the equivalent to the Polaris's like GPS tracking Ride system. Command. Yeah. What yep. is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Ride command. So you guys can connect each other. Yep. So trail tech is that exactly wow. that, but, um, we buy it at Canadian Tire, throw it on our skidoos, and now I can see where you are. I can hook up to your group. 
And so he buys it for his. So wait, you, can you hook up to totally. my ride command? Or uh -huh. do I have to have a... No, ride? Nope. Trail Tech works I with ride command. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of the, like, I'm riding with my Polaris buddies. I got my Trail Tech, which is a little pricey, but now I can ride, I can hook up to all my Polaris buddies and any Skidoo buddies who have the Trail Tech 2, which my little that group is all awesome. has. Yeah. Did not even know that thing existed. It's, yeah, so it's it, can, it can provide a false sense of security, but once you manage the false sense of security and don't completely, utterly trust it with your group habits, it is an amazing tool mm -hmm. to have. Yeah. So those are my three. Bars, risers, trail tech. And that's an industry Bars, problem. Riser, they all, all them cat, the rest of them, you know, they need to take that and make it a safety concern yeah. for backcountry mm -hmm. riding. Yeah. What are your three? Of course, cockpit controls for sure. Brake levers, hands, uh, match to my body width and size. Mm -hmm. um, you know, riding a skidoo, it's straight to shocks. Mm -hmm. uh, never, and most of the manufacturers at this point, never really produce a calibrated shock for my liking so i go after them fairly quick and uh yeah you know i'm a sucker for the pricey diamond s can it's feather light and uh and it's fairly quiet still yeah. and i like the i like the extra space because as a backcountry guy and especially like the Revelstoke area we're removed where we ride so mm -hmm. i you know i stuff in guides tarps and a bunch of backcountry survival stuff i don't want on my mm. backpack mm -hmm. so the extra space uh and maneuvering of key backcountry survival things so it's not on my person yeah uh, i go after a, a can that's somewhat quiet nice yeah okay so those are the three learn something new with trail tech so that's awesome the last question is what is one thing that we, people who are listening, watching, snowmobile community, do not know about you? What's the secret? Interesting. Who wants to go first, Sheena? Me. No, you Jeremy's go first. Jeremy's going first. I, I forgot to think about this one. Go ahead. <laughs> Interesting thing that most people don't know about me. Mm, well, everybody knows I don't have any teeth. Um, uh, um, we're heavily into scuba diving now, so scuba. we yeah we work uh, we work all winter and and do our passion, which mm -hmm. is snowmobiling. Try to make it as fun and not lose that passion, and then we uh, we leave every year in May for a month to a scuba diving location, and it's new to me, and I'm terrified of sharks. Okay, so, and so, so learning to you're, manage you're the shark head on risk. with that yeah with that fear going then. for it yeah yeah there we go totally so we're into that every every spring now so that's cool for the last couple of years. Yeah. We got engaged under the water. Mm -hmm. yeah. We did scuba diving. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say that maybe. That oh. was my thing. Oh, oh no, you That was my thing. It. That's cool. <laughs> that, All right, now it's that was turn. my thing. I got engaged scuba diving underwater. He didn't even actually have to ask the question. So he's never asked me the question. He yeah. just pulled out the ring. Really? So. Well, yeah. Well, it was kind of weird. It got awkward. and. <laughs> Because <laughs> I just learned to scuba dive. You took dive. the ring down under the water? Well, I had my dive master hide the ring, and then I kind of swam her over to it. That's pretty ballsy. Yeah. What if you drop that thing? Well, actually, she wears my mom's uh, wedding ring, but uh -huh. I had, a, like, a street vendor just whittle me something there about a quartz and stuff. Yep. Play it safe. Yep. Yeah. Meaning still the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, most people don't know that story. Yeah. Got engaged underwater. Underwater, yeah. In Roatan, Honduras. It's a great place. Yeah, it was cool. It was super cool. And and we were we were looking for some new adventure. I've been, both of us have been in the mountains for so long, and that's all we do is ride the mountains. So getting to the ocean is kind of maybe that a little new reset adventure. thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're still at the Alberta show. Let's see. There's still people down there roaming around. We're on the third yeah. floor up here. We kind of we kind of we got some VIP. VIP treatment up here. It took us a while, but we got, we finally made it up here. The Alberta Snowmobile Show, Chris Brooks. Yeah, uh, thank you. Long, long running show, and still here strong even after COVID. Uh, one of the one of the great uh, snowmobile club organizations. I've actually worked with this club for years about uh, avalanche safety, all the way into ISMA and some yeah. of the American organizations. Uh, it's a strong operating club, and and we're losing connections. So get out there and join your local club. Yep, it's, it needs it. to protect yep. land. All right. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thank you.